Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. COVID-19 and the prisons opening up the economy, colleges and universities back soon. As they say, let's get to it. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and now here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, welcome back. Well, first of all, we're going to start out with colleges and universities opening soon. Joining me is Jamie Martin. She's the president of the Association of Pennsylvania State College and Universities. Welcome, Jamie. And you're also a criminologist. You teach criminology at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Well, we have something like 338 colleges and universities in the state of Pennsylvania. I'm talking about trade schools as well. Of course, you're president of the association that uh, basically consists of faculty and coaches in the 14 publicly owned universities in the state. Some 95,000 students will be returning relatively soon, and what a challenge it is to keep them safe. Do I, do I have that correct? Oh, absolutely correct. Uh, I'm, I'm really concerned. Our colleagues are really concerned about the safety of the students. Uh, the safety of the staff, the safety of the faculty, as we're trying to uh, figure out how to bring students back. And we now have over 100,000 cases of COVID-19 in, in the Commonwealth and I think past uh, 7,000 deaths recently. You know, Terry, we kept them home in, after, after spring break when we had about 70, 80 cases. And now we're bringing them back in the midst of 100,000. So everybody's very concerned. Yeah, well, let's start, I mean, Obviously, you have to. Uh, mo most colleges are doing what we call a hybrid. They're doing some in person, and then they're doing uh, some uh, online. It's, it's what we call a hybrid. Some are doing all online, and yes. relatively few are saying we're going to do it in person. I noticed that a couple of the Ivy League schools have said they're going to do it online all academic year, not just in the fall semester. So, is this hybrid? Uh, workable, it seems very, very complicated to me. Maybe I don't want to exaggerate it, but it just seems complicated. It is complicated. And as you mentioned, uh, a, a few universities, Westchester, uh, Edinburgh now announced yesterday, and East Stroudsburg last week announced they're going remote. At most of the others, it's some type of combination of face-to-face -face and hybrid. I can give you an example of what they're planning uh, here at IUP because it's fairly, I think, similar. Uh, we'll have faculty members in the classroom for all of their classes. They'll divide the class into probably thirds, and a third of the students will be in the class on a, on a Monday, and the other two uh, groups would be Zooming in. So it's going to be difficult uh, for the faculty and the students, and for the students, it's not going to look the same as it did before. Everybody would be required to wear masks, socially distance, uh, and all of those kinds of things, and I think that's where some of the faculty fears are playing into this as to whether or not students will actually do those things when they're away from uh, away from the classroom. Yeah, I want to get to the faculty fears, yeah. and and I know you did a survey, and you've got a substantial number of professors who have weighed in on this. But before I do, it's not just what goes on in the classroom, but students are in housing, their their proximity. It's hard to keep social distancing, and presumably mm -hmm. they can wear masks. Uh, then you have all the social events that goes on that go on in colleges and as universities as well. So it's complicated. It's just not figuring out how to do in person and keep the distancing, move, move the tables and you know the chairs around so that uh, they can be safe. But it's it's a condensed population that that is is also seri a serious problem. Right, and as you mentioned, we did we did a survey of. Uh in the early July, we sent it out to 48 of our members and 3,200 responded. So we had a 66 response rate from all 14 universities, um, adjunct tenure track, tenure faculty. And exactly what we are talking about, that the concern that you know our students who are in uh, the age range where we're seeing the spike, uh, driving the spike in COVID cases, the concern is that they're going to be college students. And not that that's a bad thing, but they're going to go out, they're going to socialize, they're going to be in groups and probably not uh, being careful. Yeah. And so we have that along with 
40 uh, percent of the faculty who responded have some type of underlying health condition that would right. put them at increased risk for severe illness if they would come into contact yeah. so that's a great point by the way that's that's a wonderful point that the young, younger folks tend if they get it they tend to be asymptomatic but when you get uh, up in years and you could have some kind of pre-existing condition this is not going to be easy i mean it, it, it is a huge challenge to pull this off and you need the revenues and additional sources to do it as well yeah and you know i have had uh, some individuals ask me are you concerned uh, that you're going to lose students or lose enroll lose enrollments and i said actually i'm, I'm afraid we're going to lose students right or lose colleagues uh, if right. they would become infected. And, it, and our faculty are also concerned about family members who may have underlying conditions that yep. would make them at risk. Yep. So it's all of those kinds of things that are coming together. Well, I want to thank you for coming on, and you'll come back and keep us updated on it. All right, coming up next, right. uh, we have, uh, how about coronavirus and the prisons? We'll get to that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association and Partners for Public Education, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Well, joining me now, we're going to talk about a coronavirus and the prisons. Joining me is John Wetzel. He's the Pennsylvania Secretary of Corrections. Mr. Secretary, always glad to have you back. Hey, before we get into the serious business of discussing coronavirus and the prisons, I have to ask you, on the social media, you're quoting Gandhi. You have a, a <coughs> tremendous sense of optimism, despite the challenges that you face every day. So it, my theory in life right now is that I need to at least start every day optimistic. And I know as soon as I start reading emails and the news, uh, things are going to go downhill. So I strive <laughs> to wake up every morning with like joy and peace and then go from there and hopefully end the night that way also. So, yeah, yeah well, that's wonderful. All right. Let's talk about coronavirus and the prisons. Can you say something over the last several months about how many people in Pennsylvania prisons have come down with coronavirus? Let's talk about the inmates first and whether it's been up or down. Now we've had this spike up in the last couple of weeks and whether that's affected the prisons or not. So give us a sense about the number. Let's start with the numbers. Yeah, so I, I you know, we've done pretty remarkably actually. We've, had, we've tested over 7,000 uh, incarcerated individuals and we've had a total of a, uh, just over 300 positive cases, most of which in one big outbreak at SCI Huntington. Um, recently, uh, as, as cases rise in the community, we've seen a couple one-offs, uh, especially among new commitments, either parole violators or people coming uh, from counties, but, um, but we haven't seen a, a, any big outbreaks. Uh, and again, that go really goes to our staff vigilance. We're keep in mind, we're screening all staff who come in, we're testing, all inmates who come in as new commits, anybody before transfer, anybody released. So right now we have a pretty good handle on it, but we have to stay vigilant that with the cases rising in the community, vacation times with people leaving states to states that haven't done as good a job as we have as controlling it. It is a real risky time and vigilance is, is really required. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's hard to keep social distancing in where everybody's in a very compact uh, spatial situation. How about the staff? I mean, you've got a lot of personnel and they have to interact on a regular basis. How has that affected the staff? Yeah, we've had uh, about 255 staff members who have tested positive uh, over the past four, four and a half months, I guess since March 13. Uh, but we screen all the staff and we, we uh, approach it from an abundance of caution. So 
We ask questionnaires. If a staff member has a significant contact with maybe a family member who is positive, we ask them to stay off work until we test them um, and don't allow them to come back until they either have a clear, clean test or if they're positive uh, at least 14 days and being asymptomatic for, um, for at least seven days. Um, so we've done a pretty good job of controlling it. And again, I, I give a world of credit to our staff who are just, you know, the stuff that you hear, washing your hands on a regular basis or using hand sanitizer, wearing masks, keeping social distancing. And, and also, again, fortunately, we've had a pretty significant reduction in our population, which has given us more space inside our facilities right. and has been more conducive right. uh, to social distancing. And certainly from the last time I talked to you, which is really early on in this, um, we, we're in a much better spot right now to control this right. this very difficult disease. Yeah. Well, we're going to run to a break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about the temporary reprieve program and get into releasing prisoners and the new policies that are in effect. And we'll do that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. All right, I'm chatting with John Wetzel. He's the Pennsylvania Secretary of Corrections. Before we talk about the temporary reprieve policy, I want to ask you, when, when uh, inmates come down with the virus, what do, you, what, what do you do with them? Can you deal with, you know, deal with their health problem in the prisons or do they have to go somewhere at least temporarily? Yeah, in most cases we can deal with them in the prison, but it depends how acute they get. Um, in, the, in the outbreak at SCI Huntington, we actually ended up using a lot of the, both the Huntington Hospital and then UPMC Altoona really bailed us out because we had a, a large number of um, immunocompromised older individuals who right. got sick. In that case, we had to we had to send them out. But we have uh, medical resources and isolation areas and infirmaries okay. in every one of our prisons. So you had to really add to them and develop them more fully for this, I'm sure. All right, let's talk about what what you all have referred to as the temporary re reprieve program. So what's that all about? Why is that important? Yeah, well, early on in in the, the COVID crisis, we realized how critical it was to reduce our population. So uh, we focus on two things. One, existing ways to get people out and just making sure that continued to work, like having a parole board. And then we thought we could, you know, target uh, individuals who've committed, who committed a nonviolent crime, don't have any victims, haven't committed a violent crime in the last 10 years, and see if we could release them between nine and 12 months early. So there was a total of about 1,600 individuals who were eligible for that program. Uh, I think the... the Bad news portion of this is only about 160 or 10% or of that actually got out on the reprieve program. And the primary reason was that the governor has the ability to reprieve a sentence, but ultimately we're going to have to bring those individuals back to serve their time. Uh, and so if someone has 30 or 45 days to go, it really didn't make sense unless they were in a prison where there was an outbreak uh, to release them early given the fact that we have to bring them back. So that was clearly a limiting factor. So we got about 160 individuals out. But the good news portion is that our population from March 1st to now is down by about 4,000, which if that happened in one year, would have been the largest reduction in Pennsylvania history. And, yeah. and I mean, like Ben Franklin, when he started uh, Eastern State Penitentiary in 17, uh, you know, whatever, uh, <laughs> to present, it would have been the biggest year ever. So we've we've had a significant impact on the population in spite of shortcomings with the reprieve program. Yeah. In addition to rep reprieve, you're looking at the history and the backgrounds of some of these inmates and releasing them uh, early. Is that correct? 
Yeah, no, the reprieve was the only mechanism to release people early. But what we really focused on is making sure everyone who is eligible to be seen by the parole board was seen by the parole board to make sure we had video conferencing available and then had our, our parole staff really work hard to find home plans. Because in this environment, it's very difficult. It's always been difficult to get people housing coming out of prison. In the COVID environment, it's been very, very difficult. So that's really been a limiting factor also. But our staff on the parole side of the house have done an excellent job in doing re-entry in this environment, which, which yeah. is unprecedented, obviously, yeah. for the country. Well, obviously, that's, you know, there's some controversies connected with this whenever you release prisoners early or you do this temporary reprieve kind of policy. So my question is, how many of them have, have when they've been out, have committed crimes? What percentage? And is, is the program working? That's the whole point. Yeah, so I, I knock on wood, fortunately, we haven't had anyone on a reprieve uh, commit a new crime. We have brought back uh, about 16, so about 10 percent of the folks we brought back for not following uh, rules, but no new crimes. Um, and, and yeah, it, you know, it, it, it's controversial, but I, I got to tell you, we sought legislation to do this. And frankly, I thought the General Assembly should have um, should have really done that. It's important in these in this environment that we have a safety valve uh, when we have a threat. If reducing population will help us be safer, okay. uh, I think it's important. And frankly, I think we build credibility. We have you know ten thousand less inmates than than two thousand twelve, and crime is lower. Okay. So we've showed that we make good right. decisions in releasing people, and we're not impacting the, the public safety. So we we really should continue down this path. All right, Mr. Secretary, I want to thank you for coming on and uh, hope, hopefully we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. All right. Coming up, opening up the economy. We'll be, get to that subject after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine Opening up the economy, joining me to discuss that is David Taylor. He's the president of the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. As always, David, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Terry. All right. Well, let's talk about, in general, we have a couple of important topics to get to that relate to manufacture, manufacturing and the role in the economy. But first, overall, what's your general sense of how the economy is doing? We've had this spike up in coronavirus. Governors have put restrictions on. Uh, the, not so much on manufacturing, but on parts of the economy that are relevant to manufacturing as well. Well, Terry, I mean, I would say that, um, you know, in general, that, you know, we're moving forward. Maybe it's a, better to say that we're stumbling forward, having been locked down for so many months, and that manufacturers are, uh, you know, attempting to reestablish supply chains and, and uh, relationships with key vendors. But I think the most important point right now is that for all businesses, to whatever extent that they can be open safely, we need them to be open now. That under the lockdown, that businesses have been pushed well past the point of exhausting their reserves. The average business only has two months or less of, of cash on hand. And so we need those businesses to have a lifeline of income from satisfying customers. We can't wait on, um, on handouts from the federal government in any sense, in any way, the, the federal government can only print money for so long. It's a, it's a dangerous thing that they've already done. And so there's no substitute for having the economy open. The, the General Assembly and the governor are going to have to return to the budget table in November right. to hammer out spending for the remainder of the year. If if we have a wave of bankruptcies of businesses that couldn't make it, right. um, then, then that hole in November is going to be deeper. <clears throat> we can't let it happen. We need people to be open now. All right. Well, let's talk about the regional greenhouse gas initiative, something I know that you think is very important. First of all, what is it and why is it important? Yeah, it would be a carbon tax on the power sector and that the governor wants us to wants to enter Pennsylvania into this compact with other states. Um, he has bypassed the General Assembly and has refused to engage with them. The House of Representatives passed a bill 
requiring the governor to engage with general with the general assembly that that the legislative permission is required it, the bill passed the house overwhelmingly it's moving on to the senate now but that this carbon tax would be very bad for pennsylvania's economy and not necessary to help the environment in fact pennsylvania has already exceeded uh, the standards that were put in place under the Obama administration's so-called clean power plan. Um, and so we have done better at reducing emissions than the states that are already in this compact. Uh, imposing this carbon tax would uh, basically shut down all of Pennsylvania's remaining coal-fired electricity generation. And keep in mind, these are the plants that when the Obama administration put in new tighter standards, these facilities received there were hundreds of millions of dollars, in some cases a billion dollars per facility by the owners to upgrade them, to make them compliant by moving the goalposts again that Governor Wolf would, would kick them over the cliff. This, this plan has gone through, uh, it's been reviewed by three different uh, uh, citizen commissions through DEP thus far, and it has failed at all three. So right. you have an overwhelming vote in the House that the governor needs to include them, that this plan requires legislative approval, <clears throat> and that it's now failed at three different uh, citizen review boards. I mean, you know, I would say three strikes and you're sure. out. But, but Terry, what's really telling here is that this was the backup plan for the nuclear power industry when their nuke bailout plan failed. The first energy and the other nukes are in support of this carbon tax in order to move the price point on energy for their business to give them an advantage. The FBI raided the home of the Speaker of the House in the state of Ohio this week and arrested five people, including the former state chairman of the Ohio Republican Party and a lobbyist for First Energy, that the FBI and the U.S. attorney indicted them on a $61 million wow. bribery and racketeering case. And so this was all related to the nuke bailout in Ohio. And for people who were in Harrisburg in the fall of 2018, the spring of 2019, the nuclear power industry spent yeah. an enormous amount of money lobbying. And so this is another reason why the Reggie plan, as because it involves First Energy and their corrupt practices, this needs to be examined in broad daylight and not pushed through unilaterally by the governor. All right, we have about a minute left. I want to ask you, now, one thing the governor does support is the local resource manufacturing tax credit. Why is that important? Well, it, it, this is a great advancement because what this means, the, the value chain from methane, which is natural gas, will now, will now be able to attract investment for manufacturing based off the methane to create fertilizers and fuels and other industrial chemicals for other processes. Uh, PMA's analysis uh, reveals that just the first two projects that'll be enabled by this credit will bring down a billion dollars in private sector investment, including $300 million in wages for our construction workers. So this is this is an enormous uh, success, and I'm very pleased that, to be able to work with, with uh, our friends in organized labor to make it happen. Yeah, and the governor has indeed indicated his support. We're, ju we're, ju we're just about out of time. I want to th thank you for the update, and uh, we have a lot, a lot going on in the economy as well as concerns about health. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you. All right, sir. we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.